are we expecting right. Jeff Lee and you know Jeffrey Lee will not be here. I'm sorry. Jeffrey Lee is uh, um, excused, and Mr. Yogesh Amling will be here uh, at three o'clock. And we'll lose Kevin. And then yeah, we'll do a transition. <laughs> uh, the first item on the agenda is to review and approve the draft minutes from our November 15th meeting. Wait, public comment. Oh. Gotcha. Public oh. comment, please. Public comment. Uh, it's no surprise that I have taken a public position against the Civic Center purely for funding reasons. But I would like to say publicly, I really want to thank the City Council, all the people who worked on the design, the Atherton Now Committee, for their efforts as citizens of this community to get this project done. I just want to say, as our 60-year resident of the community, thank you, even though I oppose it. I also want to say to the people who in this town who did not step up to their civic responsibility to help us achieve this goal. What would your mother say? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any other public comment? Then we will move on to item number three to review and approve the draft minutes of the November 15th meeting. Uh, November 15th was so long ago that I'm not sure <laughs> that I could tell you if they're correct or not, but I believe them to be. Uh, any dissenters? I really I, and I didn't see anything. So I'll, I move we, we approve. Second, please. Jeez. I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, now we're back to OPEB. Where do I put it? Should we just turn the button on the side? Towards that area. back there. Yeah. Okay, so um, we did this at the last meeting, but uh, we didn't have Ken here, so we didn't have a quorum to make the necessary recommendations to the council. So Jim has seen this before. Uh, Carrie's seen it before. Michael, you've seen it before too, so you don't need to yep. see it, I guess. Um, okay. But this is regarding uh, OPEP benefits. But basically, health care benefits that we owe people that work for the town. Um, we've op African operated uh, pay as you go. Uh, we had no funding for unaccrued liabilities up through 2012. Um, <coughs> Gasby 45 came in and said we had to account for these liabilities on our financial statements uh, beginning, I believe it was last year. Um, and that we had to uh, get an actuarial firm to update these liabilities on an every other year basis, um, as well as the annual re required contribution. In other words, how much we have to, would have to put in to fully fund it over a 30-year uh, period. So the first one of these that Nikolai Consulting did for us was in 2012, and they calculated that we had an accrued, actuarial accrued liability of $7.7 .7 million for uh, both our actives and our retired uh, employees. Um, at that point, we had, we had no, made no payments whatsoever to fund these. Again, we were just doing pay as you go. So when somebody had a, got sick, we, we paid the bill. Two years later, July 1st, 2014, uh, Nikolai updated the report uh, we got to 7.4 7 uh, million dollars. Actually, our, our accrued liability declined slightly. Um, meanwhile, we had uh, begun a funding program to reduce these unfunded liabilities, which we're now going to be seen on our balance sheet. So in fiscal year 12 and 13, we put in a million three, 13, 14, another two million, 14, 15, a million 20, and 15, 16, another $680,000. Most of this, if not all of it, came from uh, ERAP dollars. So in, in that period of time, we'd actually put five million bucks in the, in the bank and PARS trust. And our earnings through July 1st, because that was updated for us by uh, whichever firm we use to do that. 
We got that report two meetings ago, I believe, for $405,000. So we figured we'd reduce that $7.459 million by $5.4 million, pretty good shape, leaving us with just over $2 million in unfunded OPEB liability, which would leave us at close to 72% funding. So we were feeling pretty cool about ourselves. And then in November, Nikolai gave us the most recent update, and it was a little different than what we expected. It was the November meeting. They did say that GASB 45 has been replaced by GASB 75, but that that should have no material effect on the numbers. However, this ASOP 6, which meant nothing to anyone except the actuary we were talking to, and actuaries are a different breed anyway, was going to have a substantial impact on our OPEB liabilities. And it's actually something from the standards board that dictates how the actuaries present numbers and account for these particular liabilities. So they gave us the numbers, and instead of 7459 or less, they suddenly told us we owe 12 million, we're going to have to fund 12 million bucks, an increase of 64% since 2014. And that our annual required contribution, if we were going to pay this over the remaining, I believe it's 24 years now, would be $669,000 as opposed to 300 and some odd. So somewhat shocking numbers. What caused the increase? Well, one of the factors is the cost of benefits is going up, which we all know about. Mortality tables, we're living longer. They actually got some favorable help from their assumptions of health plan costs. I don't know how that came about, but it did. We had some bad demographics. We had some disabilities and some on-the-job issues that were fairly significant. But the main culprit in this increase of 64% was this ASOP 6 change, a new ruling by the Actuarial Standards Board, and what it defines as an implicit subsidy. So what's an implicit subsidy? The town of Atherton owes the money. It's our liability. But we provide the benefits through CalPERS, which is a community-rated plan, meaning regardless of the demographics of our little population, we get a rate that's blended with the huge population of CalPERS. Well, in theory, this community over here could have 50 people that are all female and all childbearing age and 50 men that are all 64, and the bottom line is that's a bad demographic if you've got to go out and buy insurance. Whereas somebody else may have all 20-year-old healthy people, and so if they went out to buy insurance, they'd get a much more favorable rate. So in our case, we're not that worst scenario I suggested, but apparently our demographics suggest that our premiums should be up here, and we're paying CalPERS premiums down here. So as a result, they say the difference between what we would have to pay if we had to go buy our own coverage and what we pay through CalPERS has to be reflected as a liability on our financial statements, and they refer to it as an implicit liability. So to take the numbers, the 12 million bucks that I showed you before, this is how it breaks down. This implicit subsidy from this ASOP 6 accounting requirement amounts to 3.2 million of the 12 million. The explicit subsidy is the other 8.9. I keep hitting this bottom button. 
So the explicit liability is the way we were doing it in 14 and 12. It, it, that's your apples to apples comparison. Um, the implicit liability is, is conditional and will probably never require any money. I mean, it would if CalPERS goes out of business or if somehow CalPERS is able to kick us out of the program or something like that and we had to go out and buy our own coverage. But that's highly unlikely. It, we're going to continue to participate in a community rated plan and so there we'll, we'll, will never be any cash required to fund the implicit AAL. So this, this is the apples to apples comparison where our last Update in 2014, the 7459, and the explicit liability only in 2016 uh, of, of 8.9. Now, again, we've got, we've we've done a good job of funding it, but, but the, the net result is we we still have a a substantial unfunded amount, three and a half million bucks, um, and we still incurred even on an explicit basis about a 20 percent jump in in cash that will ultimately be required to fund the liability. So um, we never use, we put the money in the PARS trust, we have never taken a dollar out. We're, we're, we're doing pay as you go for our costs, so we're not depleting the fund. Um, in the budget uh, this year is approximately $465,000 to fund uh, medical benefits. Um, Nikolai, as a part of their report in November, said that um, the earned increase, and that's what we're talking about, it, 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 pay, pay as you go means you pay as the expenses come up, not as they're earned by the employees, but the earned increase for the, this fiscal year is about 92 grand. Um, we could use, as we have in the past, our ERAP dollars, and I believe we've got a million and one something. We could use part of the ERAP dollars to cover that earned increase. In other words, put 92K in the PARS trust. Um, we could also use ERAP dollars to make additional contributions to the PARS trust if the council decides that that, that 70 percentage number is, is a desirable number or if they want to use that money elsewhere, we'll, we just won't have that level of funding. And I don't really remember that we saw it, but we're shooting for a percentage. I think $5 million was a number that got picked from somewhere, wasn't it? It was, sort of, but if you could go back a slide, it actually represented or represented the 90% of the retiree portion. And the oh, okay. rationale was, because the town stopped retiree health care yeah. for any new member, so the five million represented somewhere around ninety percent of the retiree cost because those are actual costs that the town would owe. Right, I remember that now. But yeah. the one point eight for active employees, in order for an active employee to get any retiree health care, and it's just a minimum contribution, they're responsible for the as a pension contribution, they're responsible for the premium. They have to actually work for the town and retire from the town and CalPERS concurrently. So that number is conditional. Conditional. It, it's it's a little more real maybe than the, than the implicit liability, but it's yes, still conditional. Correct. So, um, in summary, uh, I don't. All of our funding decisions, any any money we put into the PARS trust, should be based, in my opinion, uh, on explicit AAL. Um, accrual accounting will make the implicit AAL. Go, go away. In other words, every year, and Robert's going to have to figure out what the accounting entries are, but every year that number is going to decline on its own as long as we're participating in the, in the community rated plan offered by CalPERS. Um, the, the total amount, the big number, will have to be shown on our financial statements next year. Uh, it's note 8 now. I think last year was note 9. I just changed that when I looked and, and saw that looked at the financial statements in our packet today. but So you'll have to do some a little song and dance in there so people don't freak out, um, <laughs> whatever people look at it. If we issue bonds to fill, fund the Civic Center, for example, somebody may want to care about those uh, any liabilities of that, of that scope. Um, 
And also, the, the final regulations on this change from 45 to 75 have not been issued. So there are going to be some rules about what discount rate you can use in all your calculations. Um, and, and when we get the final guidelines, we're going to have to rely on Nikolai, I guess, to help us develop a funding plan that allows us to continue to use a 6% rate. Um, because uh, otherwise the numbers will, will balloon further. Um, so I, I think what we need to do is make a recommendation to the City Council. First of all, accept their report. None of us, I don't think here, could prove the report to be wrong. The only way you could, <laughs> I mean, actuaries are at, get, we'd have to fire, hire another actuary to ch double check their work. Uh, is the only way we can say they're wrong. We have to assume they know what they're doing. Um, we, I would recommend that the city council use ERAP funds to make at least that $92,000 contribution to the PARS Trust, more if they deem fit, um, depending upon if they want to get to the 90% of the retiree number again or whether they want to hold off on that. No required action. The $92,000, uh, Nikolai seemed to think, could have an impact on the discount rate that we're allowed to use, so I think that's necessary. And then to, once the final guidelines are issued that they develop a, or ask us to develop an OPEP funding plan for the next fiscal year, which isn't that far away now. So I went through that quickly because Jim was, would fall asleep yeah, just watched it too many times. But. Yeah. Just a question. We're going to discuss an alternative use for ERAV funds today. It's not an added to Civic Center project. So can, how do we reconcile if we recommend one or the other splitting the funds, if we even get the funds? I mean, this was the original plan in July, but that's been altered by what we're going to discuss today as far as I, from what I've read. So I think what we will still, um, as we do the exercise in, in the budget process, thought that this was a pretty good plan. I mean, you know, we were looking for a motion uh, to do this. Yeah, I mean, yes. Except the community action plan is presented. Some of them said we'll consider. So that just means we consider it. Uh, that would be a motion, at least for number three there. What? As opposed to actually do something. Well, the city council doesn't have to do anything you say. Fine. So it, it would be our recommendation that they that they make the 92k and consider that's fine I mean you know it's just we're not making the recommendation that they actually use funds that they no, the funds. I mean, because things change that's fine. and there seems that's to be a lot of change right seems to be a lot of change in the year right now <laughs> so motion I'll second it all in favor aye uh, all right I'm done with that one Yeah, you weren't here for the Nikolai report. That was quite an experience. I, got so, well, I remember the report in November, which was yeah, I Well, it's just worked out really well for me. All I had to do was just show up and say, okay, that makes sense. Let's yeah. do that. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Glad to really, you know, carry my own weight around. So now we're going to move on to financial statements. Um, I don't know who all. Uh, I can. I can. Um, yes. Take this one. Uh, so, so next item is item number uh, five. It's the presentation of, of fiscal year 2015-16 uh, average and basic financial statements, and we're looking for a recommendation of acceptance to the city council. Uh, the, based on the staff report, I'm going off the staff report, uh, the general fund is the uh, chief operating fund of the town. Uh, based on their, our auditor's opinion, they present fairly in all material respects to respect the financial position of the government activities, each major fund, 
an aggregate lien upon information of account as of June 30, 2016. So for 15-16 actual, the general fund had a net change of fund balance of a negative $365,311 during the fiscal year. Majority, if you can see it in the chart that I provided in there, you can see that there was a net transfers out of $4.2 million. So you take that out, and the general fund would have a net change of fund balance of $3.869 million for that. So it looks like we are in a deficit, but the reason we are is those transfers out. And the bulk of that went to – well, it went to $680,000 to OPEB, $631,000 to workers' comp, $614,000 to 2016 capital improvement projects, and $2.3 million for futures. Yes, and correct, and those were the main components of that transfers out. So at the end of the fiscal year, the unassigned fund balance of the general fund was $11,070,130, with a total fund balance of $13,305,842. In the report, it was $13,670,000 in my staff report. That's wrong. Right, it's wrong. But the actual is $13,305,842 in the financial statement. So the unassigned fund balance represents 103.8% of the total general fund expenditures, which we had of $10.6 million. So – I have one question. Yes, sir. About your staff report. The bottom of the page where you list the recognized pension expense of $594,000. Yes. Since I realize that the deferred inflows and outflows are pension related, but that $594,000 doesn't fit into any of that, does it? It does in the second page of that report. I'm sorry, on page three of the report. So it doesn't in the actual net position component. Because it's expense. Right, because it's expense. So on that page three is the breakdown based on the GASB 68-671 of the miscellaneous employees net pension liabilities, $2.9 million. Right. Safety employees is $7.7. And when you net out the outflows and inflows, it gives you the $11.67 million adjustment to net pension. Correct. Right. But the $594,000 is just – it's just another number. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, I was just mentioning just what our obligation at that time recognized. Correct. And then regarding that, so we had a net change in net position for the town in the amount of $6,151,046 for an ending net position of $54,788,000. And this is on page three of the staff report. Compared to last year's net position was $48.6 million. If we – because of the reduction of the $11.6 million for the adjustment of reporting the net pension liability, outflows, and inflows, if you back that out, our net position would be $66.4 million for the fiscal year. And again, a reminder, as beginning of last year going forward, last year was the beginning of when we recorded the net pension liability. Going forward, we will always go through the same exercise based on what has happened as a measurement of time at the end of each fiscal year. So going forward, pretty much the general fund had a, again, $14 million in revenue to $10.6 million in expenditures. We had a positive balance, but however, the council took action to make a transfer out to the various components that Mr. Fleer had mentioned earlier. So we're in a good financial position. We continue to monitor the general fund, and the operating budget continues to rely on being on fiscal prudence and recognizing our economy, recognizing our needs as a community within operations and expenditures, and providing a level of service within the town. Within the staff report mentioned the projects that we're working on currently within the town, and 
We're continuing to pay down long-term liabilities. That still continues to be a priority and provide funding within our capital improvement program. So staff is just seeking a, without, if there's any questions, I can answer those, but staff is just seeking a committee recommendation to the city council to accept the fiscal year 2015-16 basic financial statements. I saw one thing I didn't think was right, but. Anybody have any? Uh, no, I went through. I didn't didn't have anything. I mean, well, I, overall, the town as a whole, we're we're in good financial position. I think we will continue to be mindful, like I said, of our expenditures, and, and uh, I think we 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 go through the process with uh, HDL community uh, companies, and as you can see, our property taxes continue to increase every year, uh, and, and so that's been a, a big component. Positive to our general fund that those revenues are going up, but our expenditures you can see over the last three years on the chart of the staff report have been continuing, um, have not been going up. Uh, so we continue to be mindful of that. We have operations um, goals uh, um, that we try to continue to maintain community uh, proper com service to the community. So we continue to look through that at that um, through the budget process and throughout the year. Um, on the financial statements on page 67, in the next to the last paragraph, it says it has an AAL number of 75944463. I believe that's incorrect. I believe it's 7459244. Yeah. And then I had a question on the next page. It, can, can anybody write to ABAG or... Uh, Cities group and get those financial statements? Is it uh, public yes. information? Actually, I, I do have the, the cities group. I have the financial statements, and usually ABAC, they will mail them to us. Uh, usually, when they get done, the cities group just barely finished last week. Uh, I think I got the email on Monday, I mean Friday. So I will um, provide that to you. I can email it to the committee so you all can look at those. And yes, you can uh, require them. And they do send those to us. So you're you're done with Mays and Associates, right? For this audit, this is final yeah, yeah, final no, product. Complete. Yes, sir. Okay, I entertain a motion to approve. Second. Can I get a second? Yep. Second. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Uh, so the next item on the agenda, item number six, I had asked for. Um, I didn't attend the, the council meetings um, where Civic Center, Civic Center funding uh, was discussed. Um, I, I read the minutes. Um, and there are some people who have some concerns about this, so I thought we ought to get an update. Uh, in particular, My concern was to make certain that we weren't uh, uh, abandoning our, uh, ma maintaining our roads and streets and drainage uh, to, uh, to fund the new Civic Center and, and let the rest of the town degrade in some way. So um, who's going to, who's talking on this topic? The boss? That would be me. Okay. <laughs> The report on. Uh, so you have a Robert Griffin report, which basically echoes, as you mentioned, by the, the January 18th council report, where the council uh, asked for funding status and options for the Civic Center project. And what staff did in that report is went back and talked about the current status of African Dow and the donations, and tried to present a series of alternatives for the council's consideration. 
consideration in relation to a potential ballot measure, now titled Measure A, for June 2017. So in it, we talked about the donation status with a projection of about $7 million. And then we talked about design costs and where those were at the time. At the time, it was a 50% uh, design cost estimate that we were working from. Robert's staff report has the updated 100% numbers. Uh, that was project cost estimates along with the alternates. And we talked about available other funds that we're using for the project. That's the building fee funds, which were designated under Measure L to be used. That's about $2.9 million in total. And then we also talked about unallocated surplus funds, undesignated, for specific projects uh, within the town's budget. And we have some of that within the uh, general fund and some of that within the CIP fund that are not dedicated to a specific project. And then the question was, okay, well, how, if we use all of those funds, does it affect our reserves at all? The answer was no. This doesn't include any of our reserves that are all still intact year over year. We also have, as uh, Jim mentioned earlier, ERAP. Uh, we know the current year allocation, and we have projections for future years. But ERAP is always potentially at risk. Uh, those were originally stolen by the state back in the 90s, and now all we get is the residual after the state pays their educational costs. Uh, those come back to the community they originally came. So we get about a million dollars a year. We're one of three counties in the state that uh, get that, although that could change as property values continue to escalate and schools end up getting their ACE funding. Uh, so then the question was, all right, how does it affect uh, parcel tax revenue? It doesn't have any connection with the parcel tax revenue. The council's not allocating any of that. So that revenue continues, assuming, again, that it is uh, approved again in November of 2017. So then the basic question, to your point, Bob, was, what capital projects are at risk, if any? The initial staff report that you have from January 2017 goes through that list, but I also prepared a spreadsheet on Monday that I know Robert sent to you uh, that outlines the current CIP uh, for the town, and that shows in the current allocated year, $8.5 million. That includes the Civic Center project. You take out the Civic Center project, there's about $6.18 million. Um, all of those projects are are going to continue. They're not at risk at all. The current year they're funded, they're going to be done, with the exception of the Civic Center project, of course. Uh, and then you look at the out years. The next columns to the right are all of the different funds that the town has, and you know, parcel tax restricted to streets and roads. Measure A, Measure M are restricted as well. So if we have gas tax, channel fund, uh, uh, those are all restricted to specific types of projects. So none of those are at risk. Any project using those funds will continue. Uh, and as you can tell, over the next four years of the CIP, the parcel tax, assuming it passes again in November, uh, puts out $5.7 million in uh, CIP for streets and roads and drainage and potholes and everything else. Uh, the only projects that are uh, potentially at risk would be the CIP fund projects. And in that list, there are four. Uh, the first is the ADA program. The town allocates in the out years $10,000 a year for a total of $40,000 for ADA improvements on streets and roads and curbs. Uh, when we do improvements, ADA improvements are required to be done as part of those. So we allocate money as part of a replacement plan to do that. Uh, the other is the town center's facility repair. That's $12,500 in the out years. That project, if the Civic Center project goes forward, it's expected that we wouldn't spend another $12,000 trying to repair the walls and the ceilings and the, and the rafts and things like that in our current facility. So that project would not be at risk either. The last is the, is the uh, park programs, $505,000. So of that $505,000, about 25K of that's a parking lot turnaround near the pavilion. Uh, and there is about 350K of that that's relocation of Knox Play School. The council deliberately postponed the Knox Play School relocation project into a year that was expected to be beyond the Civic Center project so that there wasn't a lot of things being torn up around town and in the park at the same time. And they did that with the caveat that Knox Preschool pay for uh, a large percentage of that improvement. That's not allocated here as a revenue. That's just the expenditure cost of the project, 350K. But there'd be a revenue side if that project ever moved forward. Knox Play School's indicated that the amount of capital required in, in, technical, in, in technical terms to put the building together that they need far exceeds their ability to do a capital campaign. So 
so it's unlikely that that project would move forward. The last is the PED vehicle circulation plan. The council had allocated an amount this year, which would be funded, but then they met with Park and Rec uh, about a month ago at a joint meeting and they talked about combining this year's project and next year's project and even expanding it a little bit. And the general consensus of the council was we should be doing that uh, as well. So they would allocate in next year's budget in July to complete out the full phase of the PED vehicle circulation plan in July, August of the current fiscal year and the beginning of next fiscal year and actually allocate another 400 something thousand to that project. So in essence, none of these projects are at risk. So all these so-called at risk numbers are, are buried in the numbers under the CIP fund uh, w which we've at this point have 4.919 million in? Correct. And they're only at risk because you're suggesting that the entire 4.919 go towards the Civic Center. Actually, what's being suggested is, as allocated is less than that. The 4.4, um, based on the, the, the staff report chart, it would be um, the fiscal year 16, 17 unallocated 4.4 million. Right. So not even the full 4.9. Well, then why is anything at risk? That's, that's essentially right. what I'm saying. They're going to use that gap uh, to do the additional pet vehicle circulation project, and so in essence, none of them are at risk. Of course, a lot of things are at risk if the parcel tax doesn't get renewed. Absolutely correct. correct. <laughs> that's the main component right there, um, is getting the parcel tax uh, renewed. We get huge pushback on the parcel tax by somebody saying, how can you allocate nine or twelve million dollars to one specific project and then turn around and ask us for more money for capital improvements? I can clearly hear that argument from people in town. You certainly could. One of the things the council did three years ago, they started down a process of master plans. Park master plan, bicycle pedestrian, um, drainage master plan, and civic center. I asked you specifically yesterday. George and I had a conversation, a meeting in the parking lot, if you will, <laughs> and uh, I asked specifically if the El Camino drainage issues were in this, and I, I wasn't clear on the answer. Are they in there to be those repaired? Because that just... Well, that's a, that's the easy answer is yes. Uh, the El Camino Real drainage improvement project uh, is a project. Uh, it's yeah, in I terms have of I have reality. Reality. I don't um, know. Yeah. Is it funded in this? No. No. It, it, no. It's design. Uh, design. Right. Design is so the project itself is not funded. We don't know how much it would run. Okay. Full disclosure, I'm a newbie on that because my backyard floods, my neighbor's backyard floods, and we're on the good side of the street on right. El Camino. Uh, so that's a concern to me. And that based on what you've got here, yeah, this all washes, except you just answered my question. The project is unknown. The, the drainage issues, in fact, we discussed at this meeting things from Portola Valley, Meadow Park, some of the water flows through there, the school. Uh, well, El Camino is, is unique. Uh, the Portola Valley Woodside drainage, that comes into the Athens right, Channel and right. goes down. That $4 million project that town, town completed just recently on Marsh right. Road, we weathered the last storm. Yeah. Amazingly. Yeah, but I know. I, El Camino, I, we need Caltrans, I we need Redwood City, we need Menlo Park to all not only pour in money but participation. Right. I get all that and that's money down the road. Yeah. The capital the capital issues. Bob, can I address other things or other than the capital? Because I asked you and I had a meeting and I asked you about the capital thing. Well, I think it's addressed. Yeah. I, I mean, w w it's all germane to this topic, I believe. I, I think what concerned, what got you started at, at some point was there was a phrase that said, create a funding plan for the Civic Center using all available general funds, which probably is bad lingo. All available, unallocated. Unallocated. Um, it's I, just but but I, I guess the, the kind of the, what has to be sold is, is the community's got to decide whether they want a civic center. And I don't know what percentage of the 
of the town of Atherton even knows where the Civic Center is. But because, quite frankly, without the, without the Civic Center project, I could make a case we don't need a parcel tax. However, and, and, and there's been plenty of, there's been enough stuff in the papers about assets and surpluses, et cetera, that, that uh, the only real justification to continue the parcel tax, in my opinion, is we needed to do this other stuff so we can spend our surpluses on the Civic Center. That's the real. That's, that's exactly what I was saying in, the, in another way. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree with you on that. Now, personally, it's fine with me because I, I, I think our civic center is pathetic. It, it's more than p yeah. pathetic. <laughs> I mean, one of the options here at, at the bottom under on the staff report from January was what if, what if Measure L isn't uh, changed, the new ballot measure doesn't pass. Council decides, okay, we're not going to fund this project. We're not going to go against what the public wishes are, even though it's an advisory vote. Uh, so we need an alternative because we still have to make repairs and adjustments and remodel to our current facility. We've got cops that are running around in buildings that are unsecure. We've got an armory back there that you could probably work your way into if you just talk the fence. We've got evidence stored. Oh, there. I'm breaks chain you, of custody. You're, you're preaching to the choir in that regard. Yeah, right. but I'm yeah. saying. Part and parcel, the Civic Center and the and the parcel tax are are all wrapped up in, in, as an issue. They, they are, but the point is, if we don't do this project, we've got to do another project. Well, what is the cost of that project to do? Probably a good nine to twelve million bucks. And how much of this? I thought some portion of this was in effect something like our library funds or whatever. Right. The entirety of the library is separate funding, library funds. Yeah, right. you can't touch that. That's that's right. Cool. So. That's so is it, is the twenty-five million or whatever it was excluding the library? Correct. Okay, that's even bigger than anything from what we read out. Um, so we're looking at a delta of roughly fifteen million dollars. Correct. Okay. It's unfortunate, in my opinion, that the council stepped out <coughs> with a ballot issued two years ago that said donated funds, without having the backup of those funds in position. You guys. Carrie and Mike, you guys look foolish for doing that. I got to say. That was before Carrie, I think. Pre me. Pre you. Either one whoever did it. The only one, actually, Whitmer and Elizabeth are the only ones we can yell at. It was kind of. I'll yell at Elizabeth, too. That was not a good thing because the money wasn't there. And you set anticipation of people in the town that this was going to happen, including myself. I thought this was a fabulous thing. The money was there. This was great. Didn't happen. So here we are today saying, okay, we're going to come back to the voters and say, we, whatever, failed, were unable to achieve the goal, and now we want you to bail us out. That's how I read it. That's how some friends of mine have read it. All the other issues aside, that's read. Then you get into, in my personal opinion, I sat with Elizabeth and Bill Woodmer and Kathy McKeith and some of them years ago here, and we put in some stuff in this town in this very meeting room. The conversations were much more explicit to try and save the finances of this town, and we did. Okay, there's a reason I ask those questions at, at every audit. There's a reason for that, and that's only part of it. So we put that all in place. Now we, and this is me personally speaking. Now we have a situation where we want to, in my opinion, take, reap the treasury to put it out in favor of one bright, shiny, penny project. Okay, I have a real problem with that because I saw the other stuff. I see unfunded pension liabilities. I see unfunded open. I see drainage projects that we're not talking about. I see God knows whatever, workman's compensation issues, surprise, surprise. Every meeting we've had here, we've been about increasing a pension, we've been about increasing the opens. And we're sitting here saying, we want to take all our money and throw it into the bright, shiny penny. I cannot personally buy it. It's just like I'm a kid with a depression, me, but my father-in-law was in cardboard shoes. He was the cheapest SOB around, but he had the money. And that's the way I, I strongly feel. I'm avoiding this thing only on the financial issue. I've lived in this town for 60 years. I'm appalled at the situation here. I mean, like I told you yesterday, in high school for transactions, 
We had the worst cars in the parking lot behind that building over there. That was in 1960. And I remember the temporary trailers were put in. So I'm, I'm too ready. I mean, we've got to find another way to fund, to fund this. I don't know, a bond issue. It's unfortunate it's where we are, but I personally, as a citizen, cannot support this financial plan. Well, I Period. I understand exactly what you're saying. Uh, I guess the first question is how prejudiced are we? In other words, what's the process to move forward with this plan? And uh, is our role simply to make recommendations to uh, council at this point? Well, the plan is put forth right now is clearly in there is we take what money we have, we take ERAP monies, which we don't know we're going to get. Right. We never know that. And then I expressed a concern to George yesterday because at the national level, the administration current administration in the first has already said to California, we're probably not going to fund this. Well, no, I, I understand the concern. I, yeah. I, I share some of the concerns, but I'm just trying to do some fact-finding here. Um, so, what, what is this committee being asked to do? Uh, I think this is just, not, this is just yeah, we have nothing to say. This is just a review, and I was just... Any, and any, any recommendations that have been made to council? Is that how you know our, our They've already made that. It's already, it's already in place. So, so uh, yeah, just from... Um, Standing here, it does strike me that, and from what I've read, I don't know what the history is full, but uh, it, it seems like it was reading the papers and this and that, that the expectation was and the polls were and this and that, that people expected this was going to be largely beyond the public, or the, uh, certainly the private fund. And if that's not the case now, then it strikes me that there's a responsibility to go back in some way and, and uh, make sure that the um, people that are going to burden well, understand the, the facts. That's, so they've got a ballot measure for June asking the voters if we, hey, can we use some public money to, to finish this deal because we weren't able to. So that's step one. But again, to me, particularly when Massey starts talking to the Almanac, you know, a member of the Finance Committee and whoever else. I haven't uh, spoken to the Almanac, by the way. Um, it's just a matter of time. I, I <laughs> they got to find me first. <laughs> it, it, you're, you're, in November, you're going to ask them to approve a parcel tax, and in June, you're going to ask them if you can ra raid the Treasury, if you will, to build a civic center. It seems to me that the, what's needed is a very strong communication program to the citizens that encompasses the two. And then the need to do the Civic Center project. It's not a. It's, it's transparency. I, I agree completely with you. And uh, I also think that just from what I'm reading here, is I don't know how much effort's been put into, I'm sure a lot, to raising private funds, but it strikes me that, uh, or I think one of you said, I think we should have maybe gotten more of the private funding lined up, they'd be disingenuous in a way. But well, okay, it, maybe it's not too late. I mean, you know, that's part of the messaging that goes out is that we ought to line up more private funds uh, before we pull the trigger on this and because then they're a little pregnant. And, and the other I was alluding to in my public comment that some of the people in this town should take more civic responsibility. The, the, the other thing is, money's still cheap, and and, and I the, the financing financing examples in these meeting notes are maybe too limited. I mean, where did the five year number come from, and where did the I mean the five and six million dollar examples were because we were going to raid the Treasury. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't, by the way, I don't consider it a raid. Can the city sell, sell naming rights to a building or to yes. a civic center? Yes. It's been on the table all along. Yeah. And what's that Step worth? Up. 10 million bucks. Well, hallelujah. I mean, maybe the problem solved. I mean, that's another part of the discussion. Somebody called John Arriaga. <laughs> <laughs> and they've solved that problem. Yeah, that's part of the problem. Believe me, I bet there's a lot, bet there's a lot of investment banks that, that are kind of out and would be happy to have their name put on these things in some way that would make them we don't decide. That's the part of what's put in front of the voters. But uh, you know, I assume they're sticking around forever. They've like 25 years or 20 years or whatever they are. Well, they've uh, offered naming rights for streets. They've offered naming rights for facilities, for rooms, and all that. That's all been part of the fundraising effort that's well, been going on. Ken's point, though, is right, uh, that's years. been to, to, yeah. the, to citizens, and it's yeah. been pretty much word of mouth. We got one mailer, is all I remember. And I just agree with you completely and agree as well on the whole transparency issue. I think it's really important. And it needs to be handled in a very thoughtful, delicate way, because otherwise, you know, you just put people in a panic, and then you're, you're you're stuck. And that's not the goal. The goal is to really communicate effectively and then 
so that you can have an informed decision. And also to think creatively as to what can be done to mitigate that. It does strike me that, again, not having all the information on this at all, but my gut on this says, you know, it's like family finances. You know, you can be getting ahead of yourself here a little bit, and especially if you haven't really investigated how else you can get there, to just say, let's go ahead. You know, hey, we already got started. You know, it's like, okay, what else can we do to mitigate this? And then go into the next part of saying, can we get it done? Because I agree it'd be nice, but just those are really big numbers. Looking at all these other things we look at, you know, on a, you know, every other month or so, these are big numbers. And yeah. We do, you know, Right. So, okay. so um, Atherton now has been out there for the last three plus years trying to, to fundraise. Uh, and Mike and Carrie jump in at any point. We'll, we'll yeah, if I could, George, just on that, and I yeah. apologize, I'm going to have to take a little break in a few minutes, but to raise a couple of points. Um, the, the town is not permitted to solicit private funds, as I understand it. So we created a vehicle called Atherton now to do that three plus years ago. They have put you know, a lot of effort into raising money, and they, they may not have done it perfectly, but they are the active citizens who are willing to step up and try. Um, and, and I think it's tough now to come in, and, and we, there's still, by the way, we're still trying to raise money. We can still do it. But, um, you know, just know they've been doing it for three years and, and trying their darndest. So it's probably relatively easy to, to criticize the effort. The town's not able to do it directly. They were the ones who were willing to do it and, and have made a real effort to have raised $7 million, which is great. Um, I also, just a real quick aside, um, it is a minority on the council now that was there. So, Rep, phrase the other way, the council's action that, where they put something on the ballot said it was going to be primarily private funds, the majority of that council is gone. Um, and I don't know why that action was taken. I actually am critical of it as well. Um, I've heard a number of stories about it, including that it might have been a form of poison pill. Uh, you know, a lot of, lot of different stories about how it got on the, on the uh, ballot and what the council approved. But just so you know, a majority of the current council was not involved in that decision. Um, and so we're left with what, what do we do now? Um, I also would note that there is no, the option of doing nothing doesn't really exist. And um, there is liability and exposure from continuing to operate in the, in the current facility. So whatever we, you know, whatever we do, we should just recognize work from those those premises. It's not an ideal situation, um, but it's also not a bad situation. We we are in a pretty good state financially. We've raised six million dollars, seven million dollars to help pay for this thing, and you know there's a there's a path forward. There's actually a number of paths forward. I don't know as we've firmly decided on on the one, um, but as far as being transparent. What the current council did was say, we don't have to go to the voters at all because the last measure they were talking about was, was deemed to be advisory, was found to be advisory by law and not binding. We decided, well, that's not the right thing to do. Let's go to the town, try to be as transparent as we possibly can, and let them vote again on this, on this measure. So that, that's why we're, we're here right now. Anyway, that's from my perspective. That's what's going on. Yeah. yeah. And I, so I understand uh, if this failed, how long would it take to put together an alternative plan to um, to take care of the kind of liability exposure of having these facility issues? We would have to go into a CIP program just to do the replacement and, in essence, reevaluate how we would move forward, almost like a master plan. How do we move forward instead of building a new facility? How do we can we refurb or rebuild the existing structures? So years. years. Three so years. Yeah. Okay. And what about um, this whole naming issue? If, if Again, because if somebody said, hey, it's for this $10 million, it doesn't shock me. Can the city solicit that? How does that happen? And has that been discussed? And is that part of uh, the discussion with the transparency and, and the ballot measure? That is one of the obstacles that uh, the town itself yeah. cannot go out and try to solicit funds from residents. So how and that's happen? why if it would happen. an independent group not affiliated in essence with the town, not the elected officials and not the staff members are out there touching those people mm -hmm. to see where their interest is. And they're the ones, right? And that's the Atherton now group. They're the ones that are in charge of the fundraising or, or is soliciting the private donations. Mm -hmm. And they have reached out to the names that were already brought from this meeting. And the answer was no. Uh, why don't you just vote a bond measure and have the residents pay for it via taxes? 
But I don't, I, see, that's where I disagree. I, I think we can, we can borrow the money and easily pay for it uh, out of our, our re regular right. revenue stream. Right. That's the Thank COP. You. Yes, that's the COP. And because if we have to do a bond measure, that would go. I know, but you could, uh, what I'm sa saying is that the examples you give are, let's raid the treasury, to use Jim's term, again, I'm, mm -hmm. not my term, raid the treasury, and then let's just cover the $5 million worth of shortfall with COPs. Right. Have we looked at what it would cost to fund $15 million with and COPs? That's what we're going to do in April. Well, April, April, April. April. well that's where, but, but I think again, that's going to solve a lot of problems. I know, and, and I think we, we've been having this discussion, but it's written in the staff report. It says the council has advised that urban futures may recommend that a COP between five and seven million may be issued depending on available annual lease payment obligation supported by the town general fund. If the COP is of that amount, some of the unalloc unallocated funds will remain untouched. So this is just a simp this is a funding plan, but this was just a funding plan. Okay, at the bare minimum, what will we need to go out to get a COP? And that's what this is. We're using we're looking at all the resources we have. But it doesn't mean that it's set in stone this is, if it's a plan. But again, once we, we go through the COP process, it could be that, hey, let's, let's use some of our, let's keep our unallocated reserves and let's see what the general fund can support in a, a, a lease payment over the 10 years, 50, which is debt. Which is debt. So the, the issue is going to be revenues over expenditures each year. Mm -hmm. The larger the COP that we obtain, the more that that debt service mm -hmm. is on that COP. Uh, so that I, I, have duh. Real I, I, I get that. Right. I get that, but yeah. I, it, we're, we're not, I mean, just $6 million bond uh, in yeah. this example with interest, uh, a monthly payment over five years of 600 bucks? No. Is that what it's saying? No. Uh, what page you when you're on the staff report? That's, is that per parcel? I'm, yeah, I'm at, I'm at uh, I got so many pieces of paper here, I'm not sure where top, I am. Top left-hand corner of the page you're looking at. Uh, I'm on page 8 of 10 for the January 18th right. report. So the annual debt service of a $6 million COP uh, is $1.3 million. Yeah. But, I mean, a, five, a $6 million is $1.5. Uh, 1.5, 1.0. Yeah. But that's it, this this example though. And then you break you break. Hold on, just so I understand the chart. So then you're you're you're, you're breaking that down in the cost per parcel right. at a one-time payment. If, yeah. if if we okay. That was, and that was that's just the a funding option. No, right? I understand. But what what the the council what the town staff has done and recommended to the council well there's the COP doesn't mean we're going out to the voters and saying hey we need another tax pay us some more money it's more of the COP is, an, is a debt. It's still a debt. Short-term debt vehicle. Right. Whereas a bond is a long-term tax. Right. So we wouldn't go out and, and, and tax the residents. But are you limited to, to five years on the COP? No. 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 So, you, you, so you could increase the amount. You could increase the time. Right. There's no prepayment penalty, I presume, the way, way it would be structured. Right. So then we could use excess cash as excess cash is available, just like we have been doing for quite a number of years now to fund projects. We would we'd be obligated to make the interest payments, whatever they might be. So that would have to be a manageable number. Yep. But um, so all, all of this, though, comes into play from the council once the bids go out. And then we get an actual cost. Once they come back, we get an actual cost for construction of this project. Then they know what that true dollar figure is. And then they can determine, all right, well, let's do a $10 million COP and not spend our unallocated amount and do a 20-year term and pay the debt service. Well, and if, it, if the parcel tax doesn't renew, this whole thing grinds to a halt anyway. Yes. So. I agree with you. I don't know, Bob, you, you said it earlier, but I think it's a very tough sell politically to sell this major and then partial tax at the same time. I think I said it before. I mean, I personally, once again, I, I, I do not like COPs, okay? After what I've read about them and I watch the city road, I always go back to these things as I told you the other day. I would rather, bonds would be my preferred alternative. 
I mean, you know, so, you know, and yeah, and again, well, come to the April 5th meeting. Right. Hear urban futures talk about it so you get a better well, understanding. Just, just of what for fun, the next thing I do yeah. when I look these up, because I wasn't quite sure, I printed out a couple of COPs, so you might want to have one. <laughs> That's a certificate of participation. Like, <laughs> I'd like to have a soccer ball. I wonder which page is these things. Oh my God. I didn't get a COP for anything. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Kids. Yeah. So, I mean, I, if there was a way to do bonds, I totally would be in. There is a way to do bonds, but it's a tax it's measure, right? Just like the parcel tax. I just have a problem with still need both. Any other funding mechanism? Well, I'm not convinced. Uh, I'm not convinced of that. Oh, so, oh, you mean if we keep our reserve or unallocated funds, use those in lieu of the parcel tax, and then do a separate bond for the process? Off because I, I'm still I'm still lost. I, I don't see any active marketing of this whole deal, and I'm afraid something's going to go wrong starting in June, maybe. Yeah. That just being attitudinal. Now, are, are, is the city council and the city staff? Are, are you? Are you? Uh, Obliged not to comment on all this stuff? We can provide objective information. The council has already can endorse it. Uh, and they've already signed the argument in favor. They've issued that argument in favor. The staff and the town resources from that point forward can only provide objective information. And when's it, when are those arguments for and against, blah, blah, blah? When, when do we get them? have already been submitted for for and against. Uh, the rebuttals are due on the 27th. And they're already on the town's website. And just a reminder, we're no longer in quorum, so, I mean, there's nothing to vote, but this is just a receipt of file. No, this was informational yeah. anyway. It's just, it's, just, it's just a mess. I mean, it, I, it, it, it's the eye of the beholder. I mean, I think if, if you look at the whole information, I mean, there's options uh, as far as, you know, the funding plan. Well, I will be brought this in April. This is, I mean, it's unclear. I mean, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm signed on the argument against because I declare a pure financial position. Fine. If we can fund this thing with bonds, preferred alternative would be to have the donations come through. Somebody actually step up and do something. If we can fund those bonds, then we can pay out of the anticipated, and I agree, future growth revenues coming down the pipe. My concern, as I said right along, is I have a problem with just taking a, a pot and Putting it over here. I just so I, I have a kind of a question. I have a question. So we have, uh, according to this chart here, we've got about $14 million of unallocated general funds. Part of it's stored in the CIP fund, part of it's stored in the town's general fund. That's unallocated at present. The project gap is probably around $16 million. If the council decided, let's do COPs let's do a 10-year COP on $10 million or whatever that number is, but it saves some of those unallocated resources to the tune of um, six million bucks. So then we still have the six million dollars in the account as unallocated. Then the argument is, do we need the parcel tax? If we don't get the parcel tax passed, that six million dollars goes away and we're back to square zero. Yeah. 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 No, I accept you. I, I get it. I just, again, it's just a pure it's where you want to pay for it. It's, right. it's where I was sitting yeah. in this room. Nine I didn't follow all that math necessarily. The, the parcel tax is basically a long-term funding plan for CIP. Right. It, it, it's, we need it, and, and, and it would put it to good use. We've changed it from, we get 1.8 million, we allocate 1.4 million to capital improvements. Before, a couple years ago, it, was off, it wasn't that much. It was only like 700,000 we're allocating. So but, but without the parcel tax, that CIP or that unallocated general fund balance would go away. Just it's gone because we're going to use it for CIP. Well, so won't that's, yeah. that's not. It, you, you have to do the numbers. I'm not say, saying it's going to go away. Our surpluses may may adequately fund the, our project stream. We we have a big. I, I have to run the number right? program. That's about 48 million. Of master plan for drainage master plan came up with about 45 48 million in projects. That's just the drainage component. There's, there's the bike pay master plan, it's about 12 13 million. I don't care about the bike pay, I want, I want, <laughs> I want, I want Lake Lloyd to fix it. The drainage one, I mean, the, the, yeah. one. I mean the, the Marsh Road project, that was four million plus yeah. for that project. I mean, that we had so to save well done in it. over several years to do that project. What was really neat about that that some of the people in the county actually stepped up and Gave Anderson kudos for the way they handled that thing. I mean, it was mm -hmm. very impressive. I think
four million. I thought the original budget number was less than way less than two. Nobody's going to complain about that okay. project. You okay. might okay. complain about the four million okay. bucks. But, but, but uh, what information would, from your perspective as a community, would be uh, helpful, objective information we could put out, not prejudicial or biased information, would be helpful? Well, some, some by far, the, uh, maybe number one is, is that I, I think a lot of our residents have no clue how bad these facilities no, are. Not at all. I mean, I lived here for 25 years before I knew where this place was. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't think I'm atypical. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that's number one. And uh, as well as the fact that if we don't build a new civic center, that you know there's going to be tons of other expenses in lieu of that, which and we go back to the drawing board and we've wasted $3 million in work that we've already done and God knows how many. So you gotta paint that picture. Um, and then tied into that, you need a discussion of, of the capital needs of the town. And people can identify with the flooding El Camino because a lot more people know where that is than where the Civic Center is. And, and so, the, so combined with, the, that's why we need the, the the, the parcel tax, and then we're trying to find, we've got to fund the civic center. These things are both needed, and here's why. Now, and it's got to be pretty easy to read, or it'll get round filed, but I'm just afraid they're going to say no in June, and there'll be enough rabble rousing by guys like him, which I was trying to stop by this agenda item. Um, well, oh, maybe we're, we're a week too late. Look at it, look at it this way. I'm turned down. This is my last meeting. You won't have fun with me anymore. <laughs> really? Your last meeting? <laughs> I'm going to show up before. Give him a certificate of participation. <laughs> COPs for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I, th this was helpful that you did put together, guys, because I, I mean, I, I, I'm. I'm comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. I'd like, I think we could get some of our dissenters more comfortable with it if maybe we ha we pursue these, a, a larger borrowing package yeah. to, to cut down on the significance of this. My, my challenge is people like Ken, who, who are members of the community but are just not involved enough to pay attention where this facility is, what condition it's in, and all they see is what's in front of their driveway and when they and their commute to the, to the office. Right. Day. I'm, I'm telling you, that's that's the norm. It's not the exception. Right. I mean, the only reason he volunteered to be on this committee was because he, Rick put his arm behind his back and levered him. You know. I, when he's here, he's certainly very useful. Um, do we want to, now that we don't have a quorum and whoever else didn't show up, didn't show up, are we even going to go on to item seven? I mean, we, we, we can, um, or we can save it for our May meeting. I was just going to show you the tool that we have um, that we went over in September, uh, you know, now that the CalPERS had mentioned that they're going to change their discount rates, this tool could allow us to see what the changes would be um, if another forecast is on. several years uh, about the discount rate, what's it going to do, the changes, and so now we're at that road. But we've been, we've been talking about setting some money aside to paying down uh, liabilities, so it's something that has always been in our, on our radar. So we just have another tool that will help us um, as we get further down the road with, with these rate changes, help us um, to mitigate that, whether it's, it's making a contribution or understanding, hey, in two years, we might have to pay, make this payment, so we're aware that it's within our budget, that we're aware of it. 
So, um, so we'll, we'll, we will go ahead and we'll do it at the main our main meeting. Uh, I'll put this back on here and we'll, and we'll go through the scenarios um, and stuff. But that's and that's so my unless. There was you, no, you can't um, object. You're toast, and I, I don't object. So Tuesday, May 9th is okay for the next meeting. Yeah, and we can adjourn. Yeah, and there was no recommendation or anything. It was just a, you know review and discuss. I, I, I will. Think, I don't, if George is correct, I don't want to get further. The meeting's done. <laughs> I'd be happy to help. Yeah.